got something called Stockholm Syndrome. Has anybody ever heard of that statement, the Stockholm Syndrome? Right? Essentially what it is, I'm going to give it in layman's terms for a second, but essentially what it is, it was developed in 1973, and it was, there was a Swedish bank robbery that happened. And when it happened, right, literally they took people hostage and they took them with them. Right? How many of you guys know somebody comes up to you while you're in the bank, says, get in my car with a gun. It's not a good day to be alive. Right? Right? Okay, so, so they put him in the car, and, and ultimately, over the course of many days, these people were taken hostage. However, something fascinating happened. Once again, this is 1973 in, in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, something fascinating happened. These people, when they got, they, they demanded a money ransom, when they, when they actually let the hostages go, the police went to them and they said, hey, we want to uh, prosecute the people who, you know, held you at gunpoint and threatened your life and held you hostage. How many of you guys know that kind of be an easy decision to make? Like, okay, it's probably, you know, no offense, but I, if I was a hostage and taken at gunpoint, I would probably want the guys that did that prosecuted. Um, and then what happened is, is they looked and they said, no, we're not going to testify against them. Now, how many of you guys know that? That perks your ear a little bit. Like, okay, well, you were gunpoint, hostage, taken against your will. You don't want to testify against them? Okay, a little weird. Not only that, we went another step further. Not only would they not testify against them, but they actually started raising money for the defense of the people who held them hostage. How many of you guys know? Not quite sure what's going on mentally in there, but at the same time, you know, and I, it got me thinking about things in life that I think are like totally okay or that I thought were totally okay, that it turns out down the road were not the best situations. Case in point, I went bull riding once. <laughs> Some people were like, wait, is, where are we going with this? It don't matter. You're along for the ride. Uh, so a few years ago, my buddy called me. He's like, hey, man, uh, I need to shoot a promotion for this thing, uh, and I need bull riders. And I was like, oh, perfect. You called me. I'm like, a little interesting. I was like, okay. He's like, when are we going? He's like, tomorrow. I'm like, sweet. Got time to watch a couple YouTube videos and call it a day. Put me on the ball, give me a hat, and we ready to rumble, right? So, so I'm dead serious, right? He picks me up the next day. It's me, Justin, Tommy, and I forget. There may have been one or two other guys, and we're all going to ride these bulls. Now, the best part is, right, we get there, and he's like, don't worry. All these bulls are fine. You know, it's not that big of a deal. It's not going to be anything too crazy. So I'm like, okay. We show up. Yeah, it's definitely a bigger deal than what I thought. Right, there's probably a soft 50 to 100 dudes in there waiting in line, and it's like this semi pro where they would come and practice riding bulls. So I walk in wearing jeans and Jordans, right? <laughs> Just like everybody's like, What is that dude doing here? I'm like, I'm here to dominate. <laughs> I'm gonna ride a bull. I didn't know I was gonna ride until 24 hours ago. I watch YouTube videos in my car. It's like, Get the hand thing, Just give me a hat, and we ready. <laughs> So, so I'm dead serious. We're getting in line, and the best part is, right, you pick your bull. So I walk up. I'm like, this is an easy decision. I walk up to the desk. There's a bunch of ladies. They're like, what bull would you like to ride? I said, the easiest one. It's my first time. They said, oh, that's fine, but that's the, girl, the one all the girls ride. <laughs> I was like, are you subtly challenging me right now? I'm like, they're like, no, that's the one all the girls ride. And I'm like, oh, well, what's the next one that's up from that? They're like, oh, um, Satan's spawn. I said, I said, okay, did you, I'm like sitting there in my mind, I'm like, do I ride the bull that all the girls ride, or do I ride Satan's spawn? <laughs> and the best part is, is I always think in terms of story, so I'm like, what will make the story down the road more ridiculous? Satan's spawn, right? <laughs> Unless you're Tommy and you rode the girl one. <laughs> so... The girl one was pretty much a shaved pig, you know, just, just got on and wrapped around it. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, so, so I remember, and I'm the first one up, so I'm like waiting in line, I'm waiting in line, and you can't really tell which one, because all, and here's the thing, like they all looked like they were fine, they weren't huge bulls, all the horns were shaved, I was like, oh, these aren't going to be bad at all. So I'm like, I like get in the cage. They're like, oh, you got to wear a cowboy hat. So I got a cowboy hat on, right? I'm like, all I needed was a big old belt buckle the size of a license plate. So I get it. So I get on the, the thing. And here's the deal. You know, I'd seen on TV, you know, the ones that were real ornery, they'd like shake in the thing when you'd get on them. Mine, I got on. No horns. I'm sitting here like, you know what? This ain't going to be too bad. I'm like, I got a cowboy hat on. I got the hand thing down, you know, when it kicks up, you put the hand, 
differentiate your weight, whatever, who cares? Just trying to not die. So I remember I'm in there and I'm like, this really is not going to be that bad. I don't think it's, this is easy. This is going to be great. Like a great story. So uh, anyway, I'm sitting there. It's cute. It's cuddly. It's warm. It's great. It's fine. No horns, blah, blah, blah. Gate opens. The first kick, I was a soft 12 feet in the air. Just, and I'm not kicked off. I mean, I'm literally riding. And I think I got maybe four or five kicks in. So the first one, my hand's up. And I'm like, yo, I'm a soft two, sto- two, three stories up right now. Like, how this bull got a vertical, right? And I remember I, I hit it, and immediately my hand goes down. I am holding on for my dear life. But this, the story is not over, right? So here's the thing. What you're supposed to know is if you get kicked off the bull, you almost want to kick off of it to get out from under the legs. If you get caught under the legs, you want to roll out as quick as you can. Well, here's the deal. I didn't really get that memo because I had some testosterone just pumping through my veins. So I get kicked off, and I am on the ground. This is real. Looking up at the legs right over the top of me. I'm dead serious. I got kicked off. I am under the legs, and they're coming down, and I'm like, God, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I guess this is it. Like... I'm going home to meet you, like, rapture me, whatever, like, Satan departs, Satan spawn, whatever. So this is real. I remember I'm under the leg, and I'm, like, trying to roll. I don't roll fast enough. The hoofs hit my leg right here. I am dead serious. I've played sports my whole life. I do not bruise nothing. I had a bruise. It tore my jeans. I had the thickest jeans on. It tore my jeans all the way through, and it bruised right here all the way onto the other side of my leg. So the best part is, right, I get stomped on, I'm rolling up, I go to run, and I just, my leg is just jello. I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to get out, I'm trying to get out, I jump over the fence, I'm like, never again, never again, never, never, unless I get paid enough. <laughs> Everybody's like, is he serious? 100%. Uh, but, but in all actuality, right, in the beginning, I was like, yo, this is fine, like, it's cool, like, it's it's going to be a good story. At the end, my leg feels like it's severed off with a chainsaw. I was like, it wasn't, wasn't worth it. Just, it wasn't. But I think that's sometimes how, like, how it goes sometimes in life. Like, in our minds, we like, oh, it'll be worth it. It'll be good. Everything's going to be fine. Every, dude, I'm, I, I got this. I have the physical ability. I can, I can do it. I can. And then at the, in the middle or towards the end, you're just like, kill me right now. God, <laughs> please. It's like the thing that you thought was going to be so liberating is actually holding you hostage. And, and I think that's essentially when it comes to, like, doing things in the world versus doing things with God. Like, how easy it is to really be like, okay, God, I know your commandments say this. I know your principles say this. I know that the word says this. I know I've heard this. A pastor say this 10,000 times. But at the same time, if I do it my way, and then we're, like, halfway through doing it our way, we're like, why do I feel like a hostage? Why do I feel like everything is being just stripped out of my soul? I want to actually read the definition of Stockholm Syndrome as it pertains to Wikipedia. So, yeah, who knows? It says this. Stockholm Syndrome is a condition which causes hostages to develop a psychological alliance with their captors as survival strategy during captivity. These alliances result from a bond formed between the captor and captives during intimate time together but they are generally considered irrational in light of the danger or risk endured by the victims. This term was first used by the media in 1973 when four hostages were taken during a bank robbery in Stockholm, Sweden. The hostages defended their captors after being released and would not agree to testify in court. Instead, they began raising money for their defense. Stockholm syndrome is is paradoxical because the sympathetic sentiments that captives feel towards their captors are the opposite of the fear and disdain which an onlooker might feel towards the captive. There are four key components that characterize Stockholm Syndrome. The first one, a hostage's development of positive feelings towards the captor. Number two, no previous relationship between the hostage and captor. Number three, a refusal by hostages to cooperate with the authorities or the authority of the matter. Number four, a hostage's belief in the humanity of the captor because they cease to perceive the captor as a threat when the victim holds the same values as the aggressor. So essentially what it's saying is over the course of time, right, of this captivity, there's a there's a relational bond that's formed in which the, the same values are adopted, right? How many of you guys know? I'm not going to lie. Like if somebody's robbing a bank by gunpoint, there's we probably don't agree on much. We probably don't have many of the same values. 
you know, it just, but isn't it funny? It's a paradoxical thing where we look on the outside and we're like, yo, this is an easy decision, homeboy. Like if you, if you couldn't go to the bathroom without somebody walking you there with a gun in your back, how many of you guys know? Not, that's, I'm not embracing that ever. But essentially, these people are like, not only in 1973, and here's the crazy thing. Listen to this. Yesterday, I'm studying for this sermon. And as I'm studying for it, I was thinking of a verse, and so I was going to Google to type it in to find out exactly where it was. And this is the best part. On my Google, there are two news articles that always pop up under the search engine. And here's the crazy thing. So I'm Googling a verse on Stockholm Syndrome, and the very first article is about a woman in Uganda who was taken captive by people, and she came out and said, listen, I don't want them to be charged. I don't want anything to come against them because really they didn't treat me that bad. And not the article goes on to say, and essentially they referenced the Stockholm Syndrome, where this woman was like, yeah, you know, some nights the men slept in the dirt and they made me a tent. I'm like, girl, you in Uganda, they trying to rip your family off a half a million dollars and you're surrounded by AK-47s. That doesn't say... No amount of living in a tent makes that okay. But essentially, right, she looks and says, oh, it's not that big of a deal. You know, sometimes they gave me two bananas, and they had one banana. How many of you guys know? It's like, yo, lady, the longer you talk, the more I'm questioning my own mental sanity. Because essentially, they reference this, that, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, it's not that. Oh, it's, and everybody who reads the article is like, yo, they wanted half a million dollars from your family or they was going to kill you. There ain't no amount of rational explanation that's going to make that okay. But I think a lot of the times when it comes to spiritually, right, we look at the things of the enemy or the things of this world and, and the things that he kind of wants us to adopt or wants us to function in. And I'm not talking about necessarily actions. I'm talking about the mental process, the mental makeup. The, the, the almost psychological effect of following God. And it's like, because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, ultimately we can write off, well, you know, I know it says this, but unless I see it, know it, feel it, touch it, or can calibrate it, then I don't, I'm not doing that. It's like faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So I can't see it, I can't feel it, I can't touch it, but I'm supposed to follow it and pursue it? Doesn't it sound, in, it's easy to almost be like, I'm not being held hostage to that. I'd rather be held hostage to the fact that money is happiness. I'd rather be held hostage to the fact that, listen, I'm going to work five days out of the week just so I can live too. I'd rather be held hostage to the fact that, listen, I, giving, who wants to give? Or, or serving, who wants to serve? Or loving my neighbor, my neighbor's mean. I want to talk about a story in Numbers 25. And in it, it's an interesting story. It's kind of the gla a gladiator story. It's pretty gruesome in some parts. I'll try and skip over as much as I can with us getting the nuts and bolts. But in it, it's a story of the man by the name of Phineas. And Phineas, at that time, what we see is people are living in the land. The Israelites are stepping into the promised land. As they're stepping into the promised land, they're getting tempted. There's some, there's some ladies that all the dudes are like, yo, them ladies look fresh. And God says, hey, make sure that you don't intermarry with anybody in the land because they don't have the same values. They don't have the same principles. They don't have the same goals. And all the dudes are like, yeah, but they pretty. Yeah, but she, she a 10. Yeah, but that shawty fresh. And all the dudes are like, all the dudes are like, yeah, but God, you know, we serve you. We love you. We're fine. It's all good. Don't worry about it. And so, but what happens? All the dudes start, start uh, get, hooking, having fun with these girls, and then all of a sudden, oh shoot, we're in the temple worshiping Baal. What happened? Right? We're, we're sacrificing. What number one commandment? No other gods before me. Number one thing not to do. No other gods before me. Number one thing that happens when you pursue ungodly girl, go to the temple and put another god before him. It's like, dang it. I, Man, so let's read this story because it's interesting what happens. It says this, while the Israelites, this is 13 verses, so everybody get real focused. It says, while the Israelites were camped at the Acacia Grove, some of the men defiled themselves by having sexual relations with local Moabite women. These women invited them to attend sacrifices to their God. So the Israelites feasted with them and worshiped the gods of Moab. Not a good idea. Amen, mom, jeez. 
In this way, Israel joined in the worship of Baal of Peor, causing the Lord's anger to blaze against the people. The Lord issued the following command to Moses. Seize all the ringleaders and execute them before the Lord in broad daylight, so his fierce anger will turn away from the people of Israel. So Moses ordered Israel's judges, each of you must put to death the men under your authority who have joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor. Just then, this is where it gets interesting. Just then, one of the Israelite men brought a Midianite woman into his camp right before the eyes of Moses and all the people while everyone was weeping at the entrance of the tabernacle. Pause. So I'm here and I'm like, yo, guys, God's coming down. We're all dead if we don't get this sin out of our life, right? We are all toast. And, and as I'm telling you guys that, we got Tommy stands up, and he's walking down the aisle with a Midianite woman, like, come, Moabite. yeah, Moabite woman, right? He's walking, and we all look over, and we're like, hey, make sure you're not hanging out with any Moabite women. And Tommy's over here just walking up the aisle. How many of y'all know? You're, yeah, exactly. It's like, how many of y'all know? That's not a good place. It, like, we're sitting here, and it, my favorite passage, right? Moses sees it. So Moses is like, yo, guys. We in trouble. Them mobile women are trifling. <laughs> this is not a good thing. God is mad. Y'all been, y'all been worshiping other gods and being all crazy. Oh, Tommy, what's up? You got that girl? Oh, don't do that. Oh, uh, for real though. For real though. Make sure you ain't like, we're going to be in trouble. But listen to this. This is what it says. Verse 7, when Phinehas, son of Eleazar, and grandson of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he jumped up <coughs> and left the assembly. He took a spear and rushed after the man into his tent. Phinehas thrust the spear all the way through the man's body and into the woman's stomach. I'm trying to pass this quick because it's pretty gruesome. So the plague against the Israelites stopped. Now listen to this. But not before 24,000 people had died. So we're not talking about just like, you know how it started? Like, oh, there's a few guys that were hanging out with some chicks and then started going to the temple. 24,000, just, it seems like a larger problem than just a couple dudes making a bad decision. <laughs> then it says this. Then the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, and grandson of Aaron the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites by being as zealous among them as I. So I have stopped destroying all of Israel as I intended to do with my zealous anger. Now tell him I am making a special covenant of peace with him. In this covenant, I give him and his descendants a permanent right to the priesthood. So not only, here's the thing. Phineas sits, and as he's sitting there, right, he goes, he handles the problem. But he doesn't handle the problem in order to gain something. He handles the problem because, listen, he knows things are not going good. But because of it, he not only delivers his people, but he gives his family line a promise from God that is carried out throughout his lineage. Isn't it fascinating, right? One man stands up and just does what is right. I mean, we're not talking about anything extra. It's just what's right. Listen, they were already, what's the difference between Phineas and the men that were killing the guys who'd taken part in the plague already? If you think about it, right? Those guys, literally Moses said, go kill all the people who've been doing it. Yet Phineas in this instance is the man that goes and kills it, and he gets an extra promise. Why? Because he wasn't necessarily commanded to do it, but he owned what was going on around him. And in owning that, he said, listen, I will do what is right. So what I want to do is I want to give us three most common hostage situations in our faith. Three of the most common hostage situations in our faith. Because in my opinion, hostage situations are not external realities. They're internal ones. If you think about it right, the reason Stockholm Syndrome is a psychological problem or a psychological thing is because it originates and it comes to full maturation in the mind. A lot of us, our actions, our external actions, they aren't just like, oh, they're acting that way. Wow, random. No, they're thought processes that in turn breed action. So what I want to do, I want to give us the first one, indifference for the things of God. And in all of these, there's going to be a question. So if you look, takeaway question, do we have a genuine interest, concern, or empathy for God and his people that leads to action, or is it a casual thing? All of these points, all of these hostage situations are going to come with a question. But here's the biggest thing, indifference, I want to focus in on that word for a second. The first time I came across it was 
a man by the name of Eli Weissel, who was a Nobel Peace Prize winner and a survivor of the Holocaust and lived in Auschwitz. And he said a statement that was so profound to me that I promise it has stuck with me forever. He said, the opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. And I was so, I was like, opposite of love is, is hate. What are you talking about? And here's the deal. This is a man who lived through Auschwitz. So he lived hate. He lived death. He lived in the worst time, in the worst possible place that you could live. And his definition of love, the opposite, is not hate. It's indifference. A lack of concern, a lack of empathy, a lack of genuine interest. Man, I'm not going to lie. This just breeds in the church today. Right? It is so easy. Here's the deal. They're, everybody is in the assembly listening to what not to do. We see somebody doing it, and only one person handles it. I mean, how often do we look and say, man, I'm all about God. Yeah. Woo. Yes. Awesome. And then it's like, okay, how actual, like, are you genuine? Are you concerned? Do you carry empathy for the things of God and also God's people? I mean, how often do we really put ourselves within the context of what this entails? Because in my opinion, it is so easy to be indifferent in our world just because we're entitled to indifference. We're entitled to our own way of thinking. We're entitled to our own opinions. We're entitled to all we believe in and why we believe in it. Yet when we actually place ourselves and say, okay, how does this line up with the scriptures? Seek first the kingdom. Be a servant of all. Love your neighbor. I'm not going to lie. All of us might be a little indifferent in that. I mean, well, they have a different political view. Well, they have a different socioeconomical class. Well, they're a different skin color. Oh, well, it's so easy to not practice empathy when we haven't actually placed ourselves within the margins that some people live in. And I just really want to encourage us, right? Indifference is such a thing that subtly it might be holding us hostage. And you're wondering, God, why am I not sensing you? Why am I not feeling you? Why, do I, why am I not walking out in a direction that truly is God-honoring or God-fearing? Maybe it's because you've become indifferent to what that walk even looks like. Because if that walk, your walk with God is predicated on how successful you are at work and how successful all of these things. I'm not saying those aren't things that God doesn't want for you, but it's seek first the kingdom and righteousness. And all things are added. Seek first the kingdom, that's singular, and his righteousness, that's another thing connected. Isn't it funny that kingdom and righteousness are two separate things? Because if I looked and said, hey, are you living for the kingdom? A lot of us would be like, yeah, I'm living for the kingdom. And his righteousness, we think that's the same. In the Bible, isn't it fascinating? It says those two things different. You can live for the kingdom, but also not be stewarding righteousness, right standing with God. We have to be people who seek those things and believe that he'll add everything else. Second thing is this, passivity. Here's a crazy thought for a second. Because I was looking up passivity, and passivity, the actual definition, is uh, it has two definitions. It's an acceptance of what happens without active response. So passivity is just sitting there like, yo, it's just this way. Just grew up this way. I married this type of girl. I got these type of kids. I got this type of job. This is just who I am now. Just what it, this is how I function. This is just, but here's the fascinating definition. I was looking up the term within chemistry because it's different. It says this, a state of inactivity of a metal made unreactive by a thin surface layer of oxide that has settled on its surface. So essentially, think of it like this. There's a metal that something oxidizes its surface and, per, and has this thin layer on the top that enables it to not react to the things it should react to. So let me bring this full circle. Is there things that have maybe settled on your life? that have made you unresponsive to the things of God? Is there maybe a surface layer of anger or a surface layer of bitterness or a surface layer of passivity or a surface layer of just resentment or a surface layer of just, oh, I wish I would have done that just now when God actually asks us or calls us or stirs us into something, we're unresponsive to it because we've adopted this surface layer of malcontent. I mean, I ask myself that question because here's the deal. In that entire room, one man stands up. 
Moses on stage in front of everybody talking about what not to do is watching a man go do exactly what he's telling everybody not to do. Moses had more power than anybody at that time. He could have stopped the assembly and said, yo, kill that dude real quick. We can't let that happen. But he doesn't. I mean, I think we've almost adopted surface layer mentality of like, well, because of this or because of this or because of this, now it's just okay. I mean, some of us were unresponsive to God, and because of it, we're wondering why we feel distant. And it's like, well, I respond when you reach out. You know, I find it fascinating. Uh, I just find it fascinating just observing people in our spirituality because really even for myself, and there almost is any time I feel like I shouldn't do something, you better believe I'm going to do it, <laughs> especially as it pertains to God. If I wake up and I'm like, yo, I don't really feel like reading my Bible. First place I go is reading my Bible. If I'm sitting in the front row and I'm like, man, I shouldn't be giving this week. I'm a little tight. First place I'm doing, going on the app. <laughs> doing push pay. I'm dead serious. I turned to Cassie during worship, right? There was somebody that I looked, looked across the room. Blank stare, not really here. I said, I'm going to give that dude a word today. Why? Because it is my, res my spirituality is my responsibility. The people around me are my responsibility. Not from a pastoral sense, but from a Phineas sense. If I look and I see somebody who's living in less, am I okay with it? Because if you're okay with it, you have allowed the surface layer to impact the core of who you are. If you're okay with people living less than their reality, living in their sin, living in recklessness, living in a place that says, I honor God, but I don't live for God. Who are we? Where are we? What are we thinking? What are we doing? Because Phineas, right, he's sitting in God's chosen people, and he's the only one who actually takes what's said and puts some action behind it. I'm not going to lie. That statistic is probably pretty close in church today, and I'm not trying to get all crazy on us. But here's the deal. How many of us actually listen and do? Listen and action. Listen and produce. The last one is this, generalizing. Three most common hostage situations in faith. The first one, indifference for the things of God. The second one, passivity. The third one, generalizing. Listen to this de definition. To make something widespread or common. Now, I know some of these have similar language, but I'm attacking them from different ways. Why? Because I spoke on this earlier for a second. You remember how it started? There was a few men who went out with some Moabite and Mennonite women. A few men, 24,000 were dead, and that was just when the plague stopped. So it starts with a few that then turns into a lot, that then turns into a widespread. I'm going to bring it back to this, right? I think a lot of the times we have attached things that are common in culture, things that are common in life, and we just, we almost hitch it onto Christianity. Well, this is how it is. Well, God, I know that you have power to to heal my marriage, but it's been like this too long. God, I know you got power to change my kid, but I'm not really going to push him to you because I don't want to push him. I could go on that for a while, but oh, you know, my financial situation, you know, I've never just, I've always lived paycheck to paycheck, so I may just live this way. Well, well, you know, I know I have a physical ailment, but God, I, and I know you say you're a healer, but I don't really know if I stand on that. Healing is a good idea, you know. I mean, how often have we generalized, like, oh, this is common or this is accepted. So because it's common and because it's accepted, then ultimately then it's just what it is now. I mean, I just really just want to encourage us, right? I mean, these people are sitting in assembly watching people die for the sin that this man was about to commit and they weren't willing to stop it. I mean, they're literally sitting in an assembly talking about what not to do, watching the man do what they shouldn't be doing. And one person stands up. I want to pause for a second, too. I think a lot of us, when we have conversations like this, and this is my closing thought, when we have conversations like this, it's very easy for us to be like, yo, here's the deal. Go kill your sin. 
and you get the promise. You get the lineage. You get the priesthood. That's what happened to Phineas. But what if I told you, you should just kill your sin? Don't look for an outcome. Just maybe do what's right. I mean, so a lot of us, it's like, here's the deal. Pause. If everybody in that listening, if everybody in that room, if Moses stood up and said, first one to kill that dude delivers our entire nation and lives, a, their lineage gets the priesthood forever. How many of you guys know everybody's jumping up, everybody's grabbing a spear, and they are in a bad position? But Phineas didn't do it for an outcome. He did it because it was right. And man, sometimes in Christianity, we look for outcomes. We don't look for just what's right. How do we live our lives? Well, if I do this, do I get this in return? Well, God, if I lay this down, what do I get? Well, God, if I do this, I mean, let's just do what's right and trust that it'll be worth it. Let's all stand to our feet. I'm going to just do a quick repeat after me because I know I'm just speaking to everybody in here. We're going to go back into worship in a second. But I just want to, I really want to encourage all of us. There may be things that are holding you hostage right now. It's never too late to break through. It's never too late to break away. The moment that you believe you can is the moment you've allowed the enemy to win in your life. The moment that you've just accepted reality or accepted your future, accepted just this is what I'm going to struggle with forever. That's the moment that that hostage situation has not only won you, but it got the ransom and kept you as prisoner. We all can break through. We all can. Let's all say this together. Jesus, I pray today that I would break through of hostage situations. Today. I choose to not be indifferent. I choose to have a general interest, concern, and empathy for my world. I accept responsibility. Today, I choose to live out the opposite of passivity, which is just accepting things for what they are not anymore Jesus today I choose you your word your way not things that are just common not things that are just accepted I choose you I choose what's right not for outcomes but for righteousness. Father, I just pray that as we go into worship, that we would release the things that are holding us hostage. God, that as we sing about your Holy Spirit being welcome here, I pray, God, that it would be welcome in the prison cells that we've confined ourselves into. God, breaking free of the chains that have held us back. Father, I pray that we would realize that church is not this experience. It's this expression in which we're called to live our lives. God, I pray that we would realize that no matter what is going on, we are always created in the image of our Savior who not only overcame the world, but saved the world, ransomed the world, redeemed the world. I pray, Father, that we would look at our own lives and recognize that we have something, and that something is you. We thank you in your name. Amen. Here's my next question. How many of us need more of the Lord in our lives? I'm not, you know, I usually stand up and at this point, encourage, challenge those who don't know the Lord to give their heart to the Lord. But wasn't that a great word? I believe this morning the Lord is challenging every one of us. You know, I remember I was probably 30, 32 years ago, we lived in. San Diego, and um, we would go into uh, northern Mexico and Tijuana and kind of Rosarito and down in those areas, and we would do outreaches. And, 
and train pastors and do different things. And man, I always, um, this place called Rosarito, and Rosarito had the absolute best fish tacos. How many of y'all like fish tacos? How many of you like fish? Come on. And I was talking and the guy, and he's like, oh, if you like fish, you need to go down to Ensenada. Ensenada was another couple miles down. And I said to my wife, he said, there's a massive fish market down there, fresh fish. and you can." So I said, next time, baby, we're going down to Ensenada. So we pull into Ensenada, and as soon as you pull into the town, there is this smell. I mean, it smells like rot. How many of you know what I'm saying? And way off in the distance is this massive building, like 20,000 square foot with no walls on it. And, um, and I said, I'm looking for the fish market. And they pointed me to that building. And then I said, what is that smell? They said, the fish market. Because, and I was talking, they believe every day fresh fish came in and they would sell it. But like the blood and all the stuff that dripped on the floor, there was no refrigeration. There was nobody that inspected it. So it just stayed there day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. You know what I'm saying? And then somebody come along with a scraper, scrape it up. You know what I'm saying? And I was in and my wife, Jill, was like, oh my gosh, the smell is terrible. I said, baby, there's fresh fish. So this is what I noticed, is as we got into the fish market, we began to no longer notice the smell. It was still there. But what happened is, as we became acclimatized and it was normal to us, and we're going along and I'm like I'll take two kilos of that and I'll take some of that and sometimes in our life is what happens is is we have a desire and the Lord is saying that desire is fine so long as I stay first but the moment I stay I'm not first anymore and you give in to that desire everything begins to stink and go south and what happens is, is that we can get into that environment and we just get conditioned to the smell. We just get conditioned to, it's really not that, been here, been, it's been like this for a month, it's been like this for a, a, a six months, it's been like this for a year, it's been like this for five years, it's been like this for 10 years. And I believe this morning, the Lord is saying to us, is it okay with you? I believe he's saying to us, is it, is, it, is it okay to you? Because if it's not okay, I'm here to help you. But until you come to the place where it's not okay anymore, I can't do anything about it. And I believe this morning the Lord is challenging us in our heart. For things that we've said is okay and it's replaced him. We can, we're not sensing Him like we used to sense Him. We're not as close as we used to be. And the Lord is saying, you know, you're complaining about the smell, but the smell is just the symptom. And I need you to come to a spot where you just say, Jesus, you're first. And I believe this morning the Lord is saying that to every one of us. And I'm, I'm going to be really frank. I think every one of us is, can be totally challenged by that message. Can you agree with that? How many of you know where we can just stop and we can say, you know, I've allowed myself to tolerate. I've allowed myself to accept. I've allowed myself and it's not, and I realize that I need to make some adjustments right now. I need to say, Lord, and I'm not saying fix it. I'm saying, Jesus, I'm putting you first right now in the middle of it. And I want us right now, every one of us, to just lift our hands to the Lord. And I'm, I want to lead us in a prayer. Every one of us say this with me, Jesus, I need you more than I ever needed you. I need you more now than when I gave you my life the first time. I need you, Jesus, and I invite you 
I invite your passion. I invite your take on every area of my life. And right now, I give you my heart, fresh and new. Heal, Lord. Mend, Lord. Show me your ways. I declare over my life that from this day forward, Jesus, Jesus, he is first with all of my heart. In Jesus' name, give God a shout.